Good afternoon, and welcome to the Your Health radio and television program on the radio at AM 1240 KNRY and cable television channel 24 and on the web at www.ampmedia.org. Join our rotating host and their informative guests live every Monday afternoon at 4 o'clock. The purpose of the Your Health radio and television program is to help get, make, and keep listeners and viewers like you healthy. And now, ladies and gentlemen, on with the program. Welcome back to Your Health radio and television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board certified plastic surgeon and I'm so very pleased you could join us today. I'm very lucky to introduce our guest, the very prestigious, wonderful, busy, high in demand, Dr. Stephanie Taylor, board certified in OBGYN. Dr. Taylor, thanks so much for coming. It's my pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Dr. Taylor, not only do you have your board certification in OBGYN, and, and of course we'll explain that what, we'll explain what that means in a moment. You have a PhD in neurochemistry. You're one of those overachievers that made the rest of us in medical school feel kind of uh, insecure, I think. No, no, it's really for your benefit. I spread out the curve so <laughs> everybody would be included. Well, Dr. Taylor, thanks so much for uh, coming on the program. You were here before a few months ago. We, delighted, we, were, we were delighted to have you, and thanks for coming again. So let's talk about what you're doing now, and then I'd like to talk about uh, pap smears uh, after that. So tell us what's happening in your professional life now. Well, what's happening now is very exciting to me because about four months ago, I decided it was time to be done with insurance companies. And for someone like me who is seeing people in the office on a consultation basis mostly, it's not unreasonable to go without insurance because it's usually a one or two office visit per year. So we parted with all of our insurance contracts all at once in a totally non-systematic, non-conservative way. We just said goodbye. And it's been very good ever since then. We've been doing this for almost three months now. Patients get more time and they're very happy with their experience in the office. Excellent. Yeah. Well, you know, we can barely turn on the radio or the television or pick up a newspaper and, of course, hear about what's happening in Washington with health care and health insurance, et cetera. And that's one way that you're delivering high quality, reasonable cost health care is just to go directly with the patients. Exactly. It's a simplified solution. You know, patients just get what they pay for and uh, everything else falls into place. Eliminate the middleman or middle Eliminate woman. Eliminate the middle person, yes. As it were. The okay. middle corporate entity, which is now personhood. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, Dr. Taylor, let's remind our audience what we mean by being board certified in OBGYN. What do we mean by that? I'm glad you asked because I think a lot of people don't really understand what that means. Usually, after a person graduates from medical school, they choose a specialty, which could be anywhere between three to five or six years in duration. But after they finish those years, they still have additional testing to pass. And so someone who is board certified has passed additional testing in addition to the years of residency. And very often, they need to recertify as much as annually. So it's probably the best seal of quality that the consumer can possibly get in choosing a physician. Excellent. And of course, OBGYN is short for? For obstetrics and gynecology. Right. So, Dr. Stephanie Taylor, you are considered a specialist or expert in women's health. Isn't that right? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm, as I said, I'm delighted to have you on the program. Uh, what I'd like to talk about this morning and teach our audience, whether they're listening or viewing, is all about pap smears. Um, many people have heard about a pap smear, but they don't know exactly what that is. And I'd like to talk about the cervix and why we do pap smears and what pap smears are good for and what it can't find. So can we start off by talking about some anatomy, some basic anatomy, and tell us about the cervix, if we could. Okay, the cervix. There are two cervixes. One is the cervix that's attached to the uterus, and the other is your neck, <laughs> the oh, cervical oh, region. The, of <laughs> course. But the cervix is the opening into the uterus and it's unique because it has two different tissue types there and the reason we do pap smears is because that's an area that goes from smooth skin to fluffy skin and very often it gets confused and cancer can start there now we've always wondered why cancer started there and it was a major killer of young women a hundred years ago the Nobel Prize was just given for that discovery about a year ago 
uh, human papillomavirus causes cervical cancer. Now, it's a little difficult to understand because there's a hundred different human papillomaviruses. About a dozen of them cause cervical cancer. Okay, now l let's back up just for a moment yeah. for, for us, for we novices at this. Mm -hmm. So at the sort of distal end or superior or cranial end of the vagina, that's where the cervix is, which leads to the uterus. Yes. Right? So, so the vagina has a certain type of lining or epithelium, is yes, that right? Yes, indeed. And the uterus has an entirely different type of lining. Is that correct? Totally correct. And it's that transition point which is prone to troubles. Okay, so the cervix is sort of like the, the gateway or the opening, as you said, to the uterus. Yes. Okay, so can we back up a moment and, and what is a pap smear? Okay. A pap smear is named after Dr. Papanicolou and it actually describes the stain that's used on the smear. Now the traditional pap smear was taken as a smear of cells on a slide and that was stained and looked at for precursors to cervical cancer. So the reason the pap smear is a good screening test is that we have changes in the cervix that precede the development of cancer by years. So we can pick up on it early and intervene before it becomes cancer. Okay, so, so that sounds like incredibly valuable information. So, so who gets a pap smear? When should women start to get them? Do they ever need to stop getting them? And can you talk briefly about the mechanics of getting a pap smear? It's done in the doctor's office, mm -hmm. correct? Right. So, okay, so, so who needs a pap smear? Yeah. That's a question that has many answers because you, many, you know and your viewers probably know that the guidelines for timing of screening tests is changing rapidly. We're getting recommendations from different agencies all the time. But I can tell you what I would do in my office, uh, which is a synthesis, I think, of common sense guidelines. I think that a woman needs to have a pap smear within a few years of the times that she becomes sexually active. Uh, if she's virginal for her entire life, she probably never needs to have a pap smear. Well, Dr. Mm -hmm. Taylor, but okay, so, so this is fascinating, yeah. and I know I'm going to learn a lot in this segment. Um, you mentioned HPV, human yes. papillomavirus, can lead to cervical dysplasia, which can lead to cervical cancer. But, but is that the only way that someone can get cervical cancer or uterine cancer is by being in contact with human papillomavirus? papillomavirus? Right. That's the o only way. It's never a hundred percent in life. Yeah. The majority of cervical cancers are caused by HPV. There's others that are not. And there's actually more than one kind of cervical cancer, but some of those other kinds are a bit rare. Okay. So nothing's ever a hundred percent, but this is about 85 percent of the causes. Okay. So, so in general, sexually active women start to get pap smears. And that's done in the office. Yes. And, and you, uh, mechanically, you take a swab or you touch the cervix with the slide. How is that done? Yeah, it's good to talk about that because I think there are a lot of misconceptions. Um, a speculum is placed in the vagina just to separate the walls of the vagina so that the cervix can be seen. And you have to see it to see that if it looks okay. You can't see cancer always with the naked eye, but sometimes you can. You do the pap smear under direct visualization with a little stick that was invented by Papa Nicolou, which hasn't changed in hundreds of years. But what we've changed is we also use a little soft brush to go a little bit deeper into the cervix. Now, we used to put that on a slide, so it would be a multiple layers of cells on a slide, quality varied person to person, day to day. We now have a new technology, which is called liquid uh, pap smear technology. Uh, there's thin prep and sure pap. They're similar. So instead of putting it onto a glass slide, we put it into a liquid medium, cap it up, and it goes off to the lab and there's a machine that layers the cells out in a single layer on the slide so they're easier for them to see. And then they can do other testing on the liquid that's left over. So if somebody calls and said, oh, could you check for HPV on my pap? I forgot to mention that. You just check off a box and it gets done in the lab. So okay. it's very handy. Okay, so it sounds like it's a very valuable screening test for women to undergo. And how often should a woman get a pap smear? Practically speaking, it should be annual. 
Now, there's a great deal of interest in spacing out that interval on a woman who's low risk, who's in a monogamous relationship, who's HPV negative on previous PAPs. She could probably go every three years. But there's a huge misconception that I would really want to talk about, which is that if you don't have a pap smear every three years, that doesn't mean you don't see the doctor. Now, you still have to come in for your annual GYN exam because a lot of other things happen there. You get an examination for external cancers of the vulva. You get a bimanual examination to check for ovarian cancer. Um, and you also have a chance to refresh your relationship with your doctor. And you have the best kind of healing when you know who the doctor is and the patient knows who the patient is. Right. So if you only come in every three years, I don't think the staff is going to know who you are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's a great point. To yeah. have a consistent mm -hmm. uh, physician-patient relationship, I think, pays huge dividends. Yeah. And I'm, huge dividends, and I'm happy to hear you say that. So we've talked about the mechanics of the pap spear. Now, what can a pap smear show us? C can we talk about dysplasia, and can we talk about grading it and see the CIN grades? Mm -hmm. And, of course, it can also diagnose uh, cervical carcinoma. But what about dysplasia and, and grading the, the dysplasia? Right. The grading system undergoes a change about every eight or nine years. And the current system we have is based on the biological behavior of the abnormalities and it falls neatly into two classes, low grade and high grade. So low grade dysplasia, which would be atypical squamous cells and also what's called low grade intraepithelial neoplasia, LGSIL for short, um, is managed expectantly. And the reason is, is that 50% of those regress spontaneously. So you don't have to be real aggressive with low grade disease. As soon as it crosses the line into what used to be called moderate to severe dysplasia, that has to be treated and managed more aggressively because that's can something that's much more likely to progress to cancer. To put it another way, low-grade disease has probably a 2 or 3 percent likelihood of progressing to cancer. High-grade disease is about maybe 20 percent likely to progress depending on how long you measure. So you've clearly identified the group at higher risk. Okay. Now, now, when you give a patient a report, is there the CIN system or CIN2 or, or, or do you just tell them they have mild disease or moderate disease or something that needs to be excised or biopsied? Yeah, I think that's the easier way to put it. This is low grade. We can watch it. You know, take your vitamins. Don't be stressed out. Do not smoke cigarettes because cigarette smoking for some reason makes this virus really happy. Uh, some of the combustion products from cigarettes get into the cervix very quickly and it impairs immune function so the virus just has a fine time. So women who are smokers have a much harder time with abnormal PAPs and that's, that's the reason. Well that's yeah. amazing. Okay, so, so Dr. Taylor, let's uh, again take the woman who has a fairly aggressive dysplasia, did mm -hmm. you say, or moderate? Right. Moderate to severe, yeah. Moderate to severe dysplasia. Okay, so what do we do about it? Can we talk about a cone biopsy or local excision or, or cryotherapy or laser, right. like what does the woman do? The standard right now is what's called a LEAP procedure, L-E-E-P. It's an electrified wire that scoops out the abnormal area and that can be done in the office. And it's superior to laser or freezing for two reasons. One is that it heals beautifully and the other is, is that it gives a sample to the pathologist. Because our concern is that if we freeze it or just burn it, we may have a cancer there that we were unaware of. It may be a very small area that we can't see. And so the LEAP is the method of choice. Now, because LEAP is so wonderful, there's a great number of LEAPs being done. And it is a great technique, but for someone who has low-grade disease, we don't use it, or someone very young. Because if you have several LEAP procedures, it increases your risk of premature delivery uh, when you have your future pregnancy. I see. Well, the, the tissue that's taken away it, by the cone biopsy or, or by the LEAP procedure, does that grow back or it doesn't grow back? The supportive structure does not grow back. The area recovers with epithelium, which is the, the skin, like the skin, uh, but the strong supporting tissue of the cervix doesn't grow back. You only get a certain amount of that and you can chip away at it only so much before you get into trouble with future pregnancies. 
Okay, well, Dr. Taylor, once again, I, I love these segments where I learn a lot. Mm -hmm. so, so we've talked about the mechanics of the pap smear, and you've talked about HPV, or human papillomavirus, is really the uh, essential main or possibly one of the only causes of cervical cancer. And we've talked about what to do if you have a moderate or severe dysplasia. Now, now um, before we go on, it, is, a, is a cone biopsy the same as the LEAP procedure? Yeah. The is cone biopsy, classically, was called a cold knife cone as opposed to hot, which is the electrified wire. Okay. Cold knife cone is what you would do if you really think there's cancer there and you want a perfect specimen and you want a significant specimen. That's an, done in the operating room under a general anesthetic and it has much more risk associated with it than the LEAP procedure. So you do it fairly selectively. Okay. And it's going to take a fair amount of tissue. Yeah. Okay. So before I ask you about these vaccines now that are mm -hmm. being offered to women, and I know that's somewhat controversial, but I do want to ask you about that. But what about uh, uterine cancer? If we, if we just go a few centimeters up or deeper beyond the cervix to the, to the uterus, of course we know that the uterus can develop cancer. Mm -hmm. Can cancerous cells from the uterus be found on pap smear or, or not? Occasionally you'll get lucky and catch it, but it's a matter of luck. And the same is true of ovarian cancer. You can't screen for ovarian cancer using the pap smear. On rare occasion, if you've got a really big cancer, it'll show up in your pap smear. But you can't rely on that. Okay. Well, then my next yeah. question is, is there a screening test for uterine cancer or ovarian cancer? Well, uterine cancer is very polite. It always bleeds early on in the game. And so you can usually find it before it's spread. Now, ovarian cancer is not polite. It uh, is very silent until it's already spread widely. And we have very few ways of picking up on it. They're hoping for a blood tests to screen for ovarian cancer, but it's been very difficult to develop. For, for example, perhaps the male analogy is the prostate, yeah. and there's a PSA test, prostate-specific antigen. That's a blood test that men can get every other year or, or yeah. every year, et cetera. So that can help to diagnose an early prostate cancer. But you're talking about there may be a test on the horizon to diagnose through a blood test ovarian cancer. Yes, it's going to take a while. We've had several try, and they just missed the mark, so we're not quite there yet. Okay. Well, Dr. Stephanie Taylor, we only have about 60 more seconds, so I, I do have a question for you about the vaccine. Yes. But before we get to that, can I give out a website or phone number oh, yes. or your office? Mm -hmm. Our website is Woman's Wellspring, W-O-M-A-N-S-W-E-L-L-S-P-R-I-N-G.com. Because we are the Wellspring for Women. Okay, so yeah. wi womenswellspring.com. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, and you're in Carmel? We're in Carmel, 622-1995. 622-1995. Yeah. Dr. Stephanie Taylor, Ph.D. in neurochemistry and mm -hmm. board certified in yeah. OBGYN. In 30 seconds, can you just tell us about Gardasil or yeah. the vaccine? There are two vaccines. There's Cerevax, which is new, and Gardasil, which has been around longer. They are a good thing. I mean, this is a vaccine to prevent cancer and it is as safe as it can possibly be. Uh, we think everybody the ages 9 to 26 should be vaccinated. We would like to see boys get vaccinated because they're not in the vaccine protocol. And it could be that there are going to be other benefits. This is going to relieve women of so much burden. Uh, they still need their pap smears, but of having to have problems with abnormal paps and procedures, it's just going to be a blessing. So it's a vaccine mm -hmm. against HPV or yes. human papillomavirus. Yes, there are 100 HPVs, 12 of which are very naughty behaviors. And it's only against a few of those, but against the most common ones. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Taylor, every time you come on the program, I learn a lot. I hope you come on again. Thanks so much for My being pleasure. here. My yeah. pleasure. Dr. Stephanie Taylor, women's health specialist, yeah. PhD in neurochemistry, and board certified in OBGYN here in Carmel. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board certified plastic surgeon, and this is your health radio and television program. We're going to take a very brief pause for a very good cause. We're coming right back. <laughs>